Good afternoon and welcome to our Museums and Practice program on museums and access. Please note that captioning has been enabled for this event and if you would like to take advantage of this feature, please click the live transcript button found in your Zoom window. Before beginning the featured program, the Museum Studies program would like to acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwa, Adawa, and Potawatomi nations made the largest single land donation to the university, offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the treaty at the foot of the rapids so that their children could be educated. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded. Today, we reaffirm contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabe ties to the land and their profound contributions to this institution. My name is Deirdre Hennebury, and I'm the Associate Director of the Museum Studies Program. Along with Director Kirstine Bart and Program Assistant Amy Smola, I would like to welcome you to our Zoom space and to this afternoon's event. Since the webinar format does not allow us to see faces and raised hands, we do encourage you to make liberal use of the Q&A forum. We will have time after the presentations to respond to your questions and comments. The Museum Studies program here at the University of Michigan provides opportunities for students to integrate practical and research experiences pertaining to the complex world of today's museums. This afternoon's program, the second in our Museums and Practice series focused on museums and access, follows last fall's panel, which explored inclusive practice in museum education and interpretation. This series was prompted by the expressed desire of students to learn more about accessibility and access in museums. An accessible and inclusive museum is one that welcomes all communities into its galleries, exhibitions, and programs. In its characteristics of excellence, the American Alliance of Museums includes accessibility in three of its core standards related to a museum's public trust and accountability. These core standards emphasize diversity, access, and accommodations for all peoples. Today's conversation will focus on the second of these characteristics. The ways in which museums provide their audiences with physical and intellectual access to the museum and its resources. Specifically, we will be exploring how an open or visible storage approach can be used to promote a more democratic museum experience where access and choice are foregrounded. While efforts to open up the museum have been in the works for decades, we will hear today about the emergence of visible storage at the University of British Columbia more than 50 years ago. It remains true that many institutions have fewer than 5% of their objects on public display. With the push to democratize museums, the increased transparency that visible storage brings has been touted as one way to make collections more accessible to their communities. Recently, Significant new open storage projects have appeared, notably the Depot Boyman Van Boynigan, which opened in Rotterdam in 2021, and the Victorian Albert's new East Storehouse in Stratford, East London, slated to open in 2024. The Depot of Boyman, located next to its museum, is located in the museum park in Rotterdam. But it doesn't think of itself as a museum, but rather a storehouse for art that offers access to the museum's complete collection. Where visitors can wander through the building, surrounded by thousands of artworks, and get behind the scenes glimpses of conservation and restoration projects. Similarly, the design of the Victorian Albert's new East Storehouse in Stratford currently under construction and seen here in architectural renderings, seeks to unveil many of the thousands of objects in its stores that have been previously hidden. It, unlike the Depot Boyman, is calling itself a museum, a satellite of the primary facility, 
and will include exhibition spaces along with extensive visible storage experiences, meeting rooms, places for festivals, and immersive art installations. The VNA East also aims to showcase the work and workings of the institution by having, in addition to the visible storage, the opportunity for visitors to view conservation and collections management projects and operations. And these are just two of the most prominent recent projects. Closer to home here in Michigan, while not visible storage as seen in these two examples, there's been an ongoing move to pull back the curtain on museum operations. The Cranbrook Art Museum's 2011 Collections Wing reimagined its vault to allow for tours and increased access. Here at the University of Michigan, the Museum of Art's 2009 renovation and addition included study cases and a study storage gallery. While the new 2019 Natural History Museum provides picture window views into scientific laboratories. For our conversation this afternoon on open and visible storage in museums, the University of Michigan's Museum Studies program is delighted to welcome Susan Rowley and Bridget Callahan. Guided by these two museum professionals, we'll look at the history of visible storage in two very different collections and learn about the challenges and opportunities presented by this approach for collections management and programming. I'd like now to introduce Susan Rowley, who will be our first presenter. Susan Rowley is the Director of the Museum of Anthropology and an Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia. She has worked with Inuit elders and community members on historical research and with Inuit youth on archeology span projects and is currently working with First Nations communities in British Columbia. Since 2005, she has been the Museum of Anthropology's member on the steering group of the Reciprocal Research Network. She was a member of the curatorial team for Cessnam, the city before the city, a three-sided exhibition at Musqueam, the Museum of Vancouver, and the Museum of Anthropology. Her most recent exhibition was The Fabric of Our Land, Salish Weaving. Her research focuses on material culture studies, representation, repatriation, intellectual property rights, access to cultural heritage, and museums. Welcome and thank you, Susan. Thank you very much, uh, Deirdre, and I wanted to say thank you to all of you at the University of Michigan for, for setting up today's uh, webinar. I'm going to now share my screen. Um, oh, hold on a second. I need to cancel that. That's not the right thing. Okay. And what can you see? Can you see what we want to see, Deirdre? Yes, it looks perfect. perfect. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, as, uh, as Deirdre mentioned, I am the director at the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia, which is located in what we refer to now as Vancouver, British Columbia. We're on the ancestral unceded territory of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. And since the founding of the Museum of Anthropology, Musqueam has stepped forward and asked the museum to be self-critical, to consider our position as a colonial institution, and to work together to create a different future for museums. This is continuous work, and we thank Musqueam for their ongoing generosity. And what you see on this slide is you see the rock that is at the entrance to the museum gifted to us by Musqueam, and on it is the saying, Winiwan set kwithath nawayathal, which is which roughly translated into English means remember the teachings that you've received since childhood. Remember all those things that you've been taught about how to be a good person in this world. And it's asking people who visit the museum and maybe asking all of us today to just take a moment to consider our positionality, to think about who we are, who we're from, 
and where we're from. And that, that really helps us to open up and engage in a good way with different topics. So for museum visitors, for their entry into the museum to take that moment to pause and reflect. So for today's talk, um, I tend to fall into a few acronyms and I wanted to just share them with you. The first is MOA, which is what, how we refer to the Museum of Anthropology. The second is a space called the MVG, which its full name is the Multiversity Galleries Ways of Knowing. And the second is UBC, the third, sorry, is UBC, which of course is the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And today I'm gonna to be, we're gonna be looking at concept and history of visible storage and its permutations and combinations at the Museum of Anthropology. And there's really two iterations. The first, uh, which we refer to as visible storage was implemented at the museum in 76, but discussed as early as 1959. And the second is the MVG, which is a second iteration, which opened in 2010. So the Museum of Anthropology is a very young museum. We were only founded in 1949 by Harry Hawthorne and Audrey Hawthorne, our first director and curator. And really that was building from the university's existing collection and creating a museum. And they did a lot of things that were very common at that time, uh, trading with museums, purchasing collections. And Audrey Hawthorne believed in very strongly in the use of collections in teaching. And today, if we were to talk, if she was around today, she would be talking in framework of object-based learning. And I think that's one of those essential things for thinking about visible storage and, and how visible storage, uh, one of the ways that visible storage came to be. And this is just a shot of where the first museum was located, which is in the basement of the university's main library. And you can imagine that as you're gathering and growing a collection, what a confining space being in the basement of a library uh, would be, and not to mention the horrors for a conservator. So the idea was to build a new museum, to use collections in teaching, and this naturally leads to these ideas of accessibility. And in the late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, Audrey begins to use the term visible storage in her notebooks. She refers to the creation of a new museum, and she's thinking beyond the university. She's thinking about making the museum accessible to the general public. And so she refers to the idea of an accessible, visible storage as part of the display, a space where the public may wander, everything under glass cabinets, wherein material is stored, visible according to region, and labeled for easy understanding. And she points that this is an essential feature of the new museum, this visible display area. And in her mind, it is more important as a principle than the display room. And by the display room, she means the, the uh, temporary exhibit space. And she's looking at it from an incredibly pragmatic uh, point of view. She's looking at it as it reduces maintenance care, being dust proof and insects proof. It takes pressure off public requests for private viewing of permanent collections. And it enables better and more frequent flexible displays to be made in the front display room. And a really interesting point she puts out, and this is, as I said, this is a notebook I found, and I don't know whether this is 1959 or 1960, but she writes, it puts pressure on other museums, offering university museums leadership in the museum field to make the distinction between visible storage and real exhibitions. So she was an incredibly um, proactive person, and she managed to convince uh, the governments of British Columbia and the governments of Canada to create the funds for a brand new museum designed by Arthur Erickson. And this was the new building that was put in, in 19, opened in 1976. And so it took a number of years before the new museum was built and enabled visible storage to be enacted. By this time, it was viewed very much, and the writings are about the democratization of the museum. 
I'm now going to show you some slides of the um, visible storage as it was uh, from 1976 through to 2001. So the Museum of Anthropology moved into its new spaces and moved to becoming, as Audrey had envisioned and hoped for, a more public institution. And on the doors of the entrance to the visible storage was an invitation to inviting all to become researchers. Visible storage, and at that time, visible storage was really the only storage in the museum. It was the entirety of the museum's uh, collection. Marjorie Halpin, a curator at the museum, presented on visible storage to a major conference and she noted that visible storage changed the narrative in museums. She said it changed the narrative from the few to the many, the few objects for display, the many kept in the storehouses for the privileged only. The idea that the people that came as visitors were spectators and contemplative versus researchers in the back rooms that were analytical. Very different from how we might frame that today, but she's writing in 76. And so what she writes is, and I'm quoting directly from her, what we have done at the museum is to erase or eliminate the distinction between public and privileged access. And we have invited the public in turn to share their knowledge with us. And I think that's one of the really critical aspects of visible storage or open storage is that idea that people can see the mistakes that you've made, the information that uh, is different from what they have been taught or know, and that they then are motivated to share that with us to help us to learn. But Audrey continues to write, but don't expect to be too comfortable in there or too passive. There are no pat authoritative labels telling you what to think or how to tell good from bad or what some curator thinks is important about this piece or that. You're going to have to actually look and think and compare and check the data books and perhaps challenge them and make up your own minds. And I think that's one of those aspirational things that we all think about when we're thinking about visible storage about having our visitors, people who are accessing the collections be actively engaged in them. However, visible storage at the Museum of Anthropology has always been a bit of an ambivalent space. People enjoy and love it, or people find it overwhelming and hate it. It's very rare when we do visitor studies that we find people that are fall in between those. So the good of our old visible storage, the good, no need to make an appointment. This really makes, is a in critical point of access. Students, artists, community members appreciate and still appreciate this value. The idea that they don't have to come and break down those barriers those walls that are still very much in place, especially for indigenous communities to access their captured heritage in museum collections. The good, as I mentioned, we learned so much from what we had done wrong. Sharing of knowledge was and continues to be huge, particularly in areas uh, such as the identification of culturally sensitive materials. The Museum of Anthropology has a worldwide collection. And so that sense of, of uh, we don't have expertise in everywhere around the world. And so people coming in and explaining to us that something shouldn't be on display is critical uh, to what we do. The good, you could also see this as good, was a huge increase in our collections. Donors wanted to gift collections to us and continue to want to gift collections to us as they will be seen, they will be on display. So that actually led to part of the bad. The bad was that as this was the only storage space in the museum at the time, quickly the space became overstocked. Baskets were inside of baskets. You can see the rows 
of masks in this display case here. The bat, the no interpretation that was discussed um, by uh, that was discussed by Marjorie Halpin actually caused issues for the public in terms of wanting to see and understand a little bit more about what they were looking at rather than all you could see was an, the number of the piece. Another issue was uh, the privileging generally of male produced materials over female produced materials because of the issues of light sensitivity and therefore no space for textiles or prints. And then of course we have the ugly. And this um, many comments from indigenous community members. The original um, visible storage held pegboard. There is a um, a uh, resale store here in Vancouver, Vancouver area referred to as Value Village, and people would say the visible storage looks like Value Village, it looks like a secondhand shop, um, it looks like a stack of firewood, it's disrespectful to, um, to our communities. The other thing about it was that people would point out that the classification system was rooted in the colonial. The system used was the Murdoch system, which is uh, geographic, and our own arbitrary system of categories such as dress and adornment. And so anybody who really is interested in looking uh, more deeply at the issues of museum cataloging and classification systems and colonization and the colonial process, I can really strongly recommend Hannah Turner's book, Cataloging Culture, Legacies of Colonialism in museum documentation. Just before I move on to the switch over to the new visible storage, I just wanted to point out that one of the things that we did do in the old visible storage here is you can see these books in this image. And these books are everything that we knew about the collection at the time. So we actually put everything out. And of course, not anything that had to do with the Freedom of Information Privacy Act, but anything that could be made accessible to the visitor was made accessible. So there was nothing um, behind the scenes, so to speak. So from visible storage to the multiversity galleries. But this took place from 2005 to 2010. And it was part of a project that we had called a Partnership of Peoples. And the Partnership of Peoples project sought to remake the museum into a space for collaborative practice. So it was based on the vision that this is the way that museums are moving forward. This idea of access and access at so many different levels and access of um, sharing of knowledge and working with communities. So what did this mean for um, visible storage at the Museum of Anthropology and our reconceptualizing of it? So for throughout, it meant working with community meant increased accessibility. And with that increased accessibility, a desire to increase the animation uh, in the space. So for the rest of my time, I'm just going to show uh, some slides of our multiversity galleries and reference um, those points. So the space opened in 2010. It's uh, just under 14,000 square feet. There are 108 display cases and over 500 drawer units. And in total, there are about 9,000 belongings, treasures, and works from around the world. It's laid out like a giant map of the world with multiple entrances from the main corridor of the museum. So the entrance that you're seeing right now looking down is you're actually looking at the entrance that is as if you were entering from the North Pole, and then you would be going down through the North and at the far end, if you were to continue all the way down, you'd be uh, into South America. So this is the idea of the space and we're going to another entrance right now. So this entrance, the idea was also to create 
spaces of ebb and flow to create resting spaces for the eye and for the body. And this entrance that we're at right now, this is the first entrance that visitors encounter. And it's the mouth of the Fraser River, which is right where this museum is located on Musqueam territory. So it starts uh, with Musqueam. And it starts with working with the community. And I started by, I want to show you this area because you can see immediately that this is a bit different from some of the images that I was showing you before. It's telling stories in this area and demonstrating continuity through time and to today. So if you look closely at the canoe, the canoe has in it uh, Elvis Presley, uh, records. It has a Hawaiian shirt um, and many contemporary works in it and a photograph. It is a memorial canoe. It comes from um, Maggie Point Lewis, who when she passed away, when her family was ready to hold a memorial ceremony to say goodbye, to wash away their tears, to stop crying about four years after she passed away, Musqueam holds families hold ceremonies and the Point family held a ceremony and gifted the museum with the materials to encourage education, but also to make that point of continuity through time that they're still here and still telling their history. So this is an important story in this area. And there are other stories throughout this space that we're just entering, but each space is organized slightly differently. And it's also about permission from the community and working with the community. So you can see here in this space here, what we're trying to accomplish in some of the areas, and we only could do it and realize it in British for British Columbia or for the indigenous peoples who live in what we now refer to as British Columbia uh, for the opening of this space but was to work with people as to different communities and nations about how they would want the, the, the materials classified. So the, er, the section we were just in, after much discussion, it was decided that stories would be what we're told there. We are now in the section that is the Kwakwakwakwa peoples. And in this area, it's laid out in terms of two particular ceremonial cycles. But throughout the space, there are ways for um, interpretation and interventions. And I especially wanted to point out, because of the next slide I'm going to show, I especially wanted to point out uh, the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the wrapped object on top of the boxes at the back here. That is a mask. And it is a specific intervention because this is one of the cases in the space. And here you can see the, the uh, case. You can see the, there are a number of masks there. And the wrapped mask is an intervention by a community member saying that the community had visited. They had decided that the masks could be on display, but they wanted people to know that they would never have them on display at home, that at home they would be wrapped unless they were actually in active use in ceremony. So that sense of that intervention, that sense of permission, and I think we're all becoming much more familiar with that as we understand more about uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and pre-informed uh, and ongoing consent. Increased accessibility goes to a number of ways. So when you look at these display units, you might actually be surprised that we can open these cases with ease so people can, pieces can move simply and effectively. I can open this case with one hand. So this is really critical for our work with community for how to um, pull uh, materials for community visits. And I'll talk about that in a second. So this is just to show you the installation process and you can see the drawer units uh, open here with uh, Heidi Schweringer installing. And here I am with Nancy Bruchman and Skooker Broom installing some pieces in the display cases. 
We also made a determination that we were going to include light sensitive materials in two ways. One of which is rotating materials. And this is the ease of access to cases enables us to do this and to use uh, these as interpretive labels in some way. So we have prints that are rotated once a year. And then we also um, are, have textiles which we rotate on an ongoing basis. But part of the visible storage was to increase access to things like uh, textiles for visitors and to create these drawer units. And these drawer units were created. And I remember when we did these, I actually challenged the designers. I said, my mother is 85 years old. You have to create a six foot case that my mother can open. Um, so these are the cases that we have here and they have uh, text. Most of the large cases have textiles displayed in them so they can be there permanently. Another important access point is increased accessibility, both for visitors, but also for the mobility of and conservation of the collections. So you'll notice that in the drawer unit, in the case, it's on black, this was done. We had communities came in and we looked at all the different color permutations and combinations, and this was the decision was to go with the black. You can see that the trays are embedded in foam here, and then you can see the picture to the right is actually at one of our storage units back behind the scenes. These trays can move flexibly back and forth, and we can also come and pick them up, and it means that someone like myself doesn't have to handle the collection at any time. So that was a fundamental part of our reinstallation. We also added some increased interpretation for our visitors, because again, they were finding it frustrating. They wanted to know a little bit more about whose territory they were in, what the materials they were looking at, and a statement from the community. We also, of course, provided ability to access uh, more information through um, something we call our CAT, our catalog access uh, terminals, which replaced the, uh, the paper sheets that we had available. The increased interpretation is uh, another way that we handle this is by interpretive nodes that are throughout the visible storage area and they are for use by anyone to create exhibitions. So this exhibition that you're looking at right now, Blessed and Well-Dressed, Honoring Indigenous Women, was created by an Indigenous internship cohort um, at the Museum of Anthropology. So we do a number of these in teaching, but we also have had uh, communities come in and do um, exhibits as well. The idea of transparency, which we were just looking at earlier, this is also embedded in our space. We have embedded research rooms. This research room is the textile research room that we're looking at here. You can clearly see it's, it's located within. We have three uh, embedded research rooms. And this is what we use them for. This is for working with community, however you want to, individual researchers, artists, uh, indigenous communities, uh, communities of practice. Um, this is a an This is a group working group of Salish weavers. They are looking at a weaving that we had that is a Salish weaving on loan from the Museum of Finland. And this was a drop-in session that we just put out, and people came from all over uh, to look at this weaving. We also wanted to increase accessibility by providing some hands-on materials in visible storage. It's such a such a delight for the eyes, but what about for our other visitors who may have uh, sight issues? And so this provides, we have some hands-on materials, not nearly as many as we should have, but there are some hands-on materials within the space. Another form of greater animation 
in the space is a presentation circle, which is where we do education programs so that the space is animated, full of school groups uh, all the time, but also uh, small lectures can take place there and the public can stop by in any way that they want and participate uh, in those activities. And then we also provide through the multiversity galleries views into both uh, conservation and into where the collections uh, staff work. So it was interesting to see the 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 other um, images earlier on, but uh, this was our instantiation of this um, attempt to make the behind the scenes visible. We know that this is an area that people want access uh, to. And then finally, um, two, just two more slides to wrap up. We also realize that it's really important that there is the physical access within the space and the ways that people can access those. And I will also say that we also looked at access for um, people in wheelchairs. And we also looked at access for people uh, for youth and adults and children. So you'll notice, um, I'm just gonna go forward one slide quickly. You'll notice that there are things right on the ground level. So that is um, at providing access to, to children um, who are also important uh, parts of the accessibility uh, feature in our institution. We also went beyond the physical to create the digital, and I just wanted to briefly mention the reciprocal research network, which was the idea of expanding the concept of visible storage beyond the walls of the building and to create a network which, when it started, had 11 uh, institutions that created uh, materials about the Northwest Coast to it, but now has 26 different institutions, so providing a clearinghouse. So taking that sort of conceptual framework of democratization and how you provide access uh, to your collections out into the digital uh, realm. So just to conclude, um, we find the Multiversity Galleries an incredible teaching and research area with huge potential and accessibility uh, and engagement for our visitors. But we also find it a space of, with, with remaining serious issues of re representation of urban communities, of multiple identities. And so it continues to pose ongoing challenges uh, to all of us to think about. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much, Susan, for that thought provoking and extremely generous um, series of slides and your commentary. I know that I have a number of questions and we already have a few in the Q&A, but I think what we might do is go forward and have Bridget share um, some material from the Luce Foundation and then we can have a more robust uh, conversation. But thank you so much, Susan. I'd like to introduce Bridget Callahan, who will be our second presenter today. She has been managing the Luce Foundation Center at the Smithsonian American Art Museum since 2012. She graduated from the College of William and Mary with a BA in Art History and received a master's degree in Museum Studies with a focus on collections management and American Studies from George Washington University. She had previously worked in collections management for Historic Alexandria in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia, and as a program assistant at the Luce Center before assuming the management role a decade ago. So welcome, Bridget. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, and uh, sorry. We should be good to go. Everything look okay? Yeah, that looks great, Bridget. Great, thank you for having me. Um, I confess I never got the timing of this presentation down, so it's gonna go either really quickly or really slowly. <laughs> and <laughs> I apologize, but um, I look forward to answering your questions at the end. 
So um, this is the Smithsonian American Art Museum. We are located in um, the Penn Quarter slash Chinatown neighborhoods in Northwest Washington, DC. Um, our building is the old patent office building. It was built between 1836 uh, and 1868, and it's the third oldest federal building in Washington, DC. And during the Civil War, this building was used as a hospital and a military barracks. Um, and in 1865, uh, we hosted President Lincoln's second inaugural ball in the North Wings and the East Wings, um, which I just always like to call out. So when this building was the patent office, um, the West Wing, which is where the Loose Center is currently, housed the rejected patent models. Um, as part of their application for patent, inventor, inventors had to submit a model of their invention that didn't necessarily, the model didn't necessarily had to work, but it had to demonstrate the, the feasibility of the um, invention. What we're looking at here is a, uh, a mousetrap actually from 1870. Um, so members of the public were fascinated with these patent models. They were no big than like a foot square. Um, so these models were put on view in the building and we're looking at the historic uh, West Wing also and, and that would have been what it looked like. Um, so they stopped requiring the submission of a model with your application in the early 20th century. Um, but the rejected models, as I mentioned, were stored in the what is now the Loose Center. Uh, and were meant to inspire future inventors to make improvements on these um, inventions that weren't granted a patent for whatever reason. And I like to mention this history because I think it shows kind of our roots in this idea of innovation and accessibility, um, which you know are two of the goals we still strive for today. So the patent office vacated the space about, I think, 1920, and there was a brief occupation by the Civil Service Administration, um, and then the building was turned over to the Smithsonian in 1958, and 10 years later, SAM, we were then called the National Collection of Fine Arts, um, and the National Portrait Gallery opened here. So this is a shared space, which leads to a bunch of confusion with our visitors, um, between mainly between the American Art Museum and the National Portrait gallery, but then we also have a gallery for our archives of American art and um, over in our office building, there is a library. I should mention too that, I'm sorry, uh, well, I guess I'll get there in a minute, I'm just skipping ahead. Um, this is taken directly from our website, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the nation's first collection of American art is an unparalleled record of the American experience. The collection captures the aspirations, character, and imagination of the, the American people throughout three centuries. The museum is home to one of the largest and most inclusive collections of American art in the world. Its artwork re artworks reveal key aspects of America's rich artistic and cultural history from the colonial period to today. And our mission states, the Smithsonian American Art Museum is dedicated to collecting, understanding, and enjoying American art. The museum celebrates the extraordinary creativity of artists whose work reflects the American experience and global connections. Um, and actually what I'm showing you right now, this is what we call our Lincoln Gallery. This is one of the gallery spaces, wings of the building where um, Lincoln's inaugural um, ball took place. It is one of the contemporary gallery spaces um, in our museum. Of course, if you were to come visit today or tomorrow, <laughs> it would be closed. We're doing a major um, reinstallation and reimagining of our galleries right now. Uh, and currently Lincoln and modern and contemporary art is out of commission. So just wanna manage, manage expectations for anyone who's in DC or coming soon. Um, and then I, just, I wanted to talk a little bit about our visitors too, uh, now that you've gotten a, an overview of our building. Um, the data I'm going to use is from 2015 and 2016. The Smithsonian, about every five years, does a major survey across the institution, and we are overdue um, for our, our our next one, uh, thanks to the the pandemic. So these are these are probably a little bit outdated, but they are the most up to date ones I have from this survey. Um, so our visitors at the at this museum, which includes both the American Art Museum and the Portrait Gallery, for their survey purposes, they treat us as as one one building, one space. Um, 
for the most part. Uh, so we have a mostly local higher, uh, mostly local visitorship. Um, we have compared to the museums on the mall, 35% of our visitors are local and it's 15% um, across the Smithsonian. And we also have more repeat visitors um, than the other Smithsonian museums, which makes sense if you think that most of them are local. Um, in our neighborhood specifically, I mentioned we're in Penn Quarter in Chinatown. That's where the Capital One Arena is, where um, the Wizards and the Capitals play. Um, there are concerts and shows there all the time. So um, we get people who will pop in for maybe an hour if they uh, have an hour to kill before their show. Um, we have a bustling restaurant scene around us too. So people who have time either before or after dinner um, because we are also open from 11.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we, we have later hours that um, we have instituted because of the neighborhood and our um, visitors. And then also we uh, are surrounded by office buildings. So um, we do get a number of people who just pop in to our courtyard or our exhibitions um, for lunch or whenever they have a break. Um, and then we're also free, which is really important to me. I actually grew up in this area in Washington, uh, in Northern Virginia, about 20 minutes outside of here. Um, and I remember coming to the Smithsonian Museums as a kid. Um, and so it is, I, I, I do really appreciate the um, accessibility and, and freedom, <laughs> uh, the low cost of entry to this museum. Um, okay, so. In 2000, our entire building closed uh, for a, a renovation. This included both museums, the um, library and the archives of American art, um, which actually I should mention too that before this renovation, Blue Center, which we're looking at right now, um, was where the library and the archives of American art spaces were. So with the renovation, they moved out. They're in a building around the corner. Um, we do still have a, one gallery space for the archives, but. Um, yeah, this used to be the, the library in the Archives of American Art. Um, so during this time, Sam received a $10 million endowment from the Henry Luce Foundation to establish and um, program a visible storage center. So we look to the existing Luce centers at the Metropolitan Museum at Art, of Art um, and the New York Historical Society, as well as other visible storage centers like the one at University of British Columbia and uh, Susan, I have so many questions for you. I should also mention I was not around during the planning process. I didn't start at the museum until 2007. Um, so right after the storage center reopened. Um, so oh, I'm just gonna go back actually. Our loose center opened in July 2006. It is 20,000 square feet and is the permanent home to around 3000 objects displayed in 57 double-sided glass cases. Um, and we also have three sets of drawers um, to house some smaller, uh, smaller um, objects. Um, we also opened a visible conservation lab at this time, which is our Lunder Conservation Center. And you'll hear me mention that uh, every once in a while too. Um, this lab, the Lunder Conservation Lab is shared with the portrait gallery. Um, but we are starting to do more and more crossover programming, which is really, really exciting for us. Um, and the Luce and Lender centers are technically separate, um, but a lot of the visitors either don't realize that or just don't care, which has been really exciting for us actually to, to find what the visitors want and um, are experiencing there, uh, which has really helped inform a lot of the work that we do. Um, so here we really wanted to get as much out on view as possible. So you can see that paintings are densely hung on screens um, and our 3D objects are really packed in there as well. Uh, to keep true to the idea of this being storage, our labeling is minimal. Um, paintings are labeled with a tombstone that has the artist name, object title, accession number, and the date that the painting was done. And then our 3D objects um, are labeled just with the accession number. Um, some cases also will have what we call a case overview card, um, just either like usually on the base of the case and they just explain what the overall theme um, of that case is, but don't really talk about any one object in particular. So, um, because while 
this is meant to be the permanent home for these pieces. They can go out on loan. They can be displayed in our main galleries. Um, and they won't, we, they won't normally get replaced um, unless they're gonna be gone for over a year. That's always been our policy. Um, so we wanna keep a space available where possible for them to come back to. But if, they, if we do replace them, any interpretation we want to be able to still apply to the space in that way. Um, so the cases are loosely themed with subjects like children, seascapes, or the Washington Color School. Uh, a few artists like Paul Manship and William H. Johnson will actually have their own cases dedicated to them. Um, Johnson actually has four upstairs. Um, so how did we choose which objects to include? Uh, these pieces should complement what's on view in the galleries. And if we had more space downstairs, they probably would have been included in those main galleries. Um, they're meant to be a cross section of the collection. So we do have a little bit of everything that isn't too sensitive to light or any other environmental factors. Um, so we have painting, sculpture, uh, folk and self-taught art, our contemporary craft collection. Uh, we don't have any fiber pieces or photographs or what, uh, works on paper really. Um, our miniature collection is watercolor on ivory, which those, um, those are in a set of drawers to, to help protect them from the light and the environment. And then we do have some wood pieces and like baskets in our up in our craft section where we, um, the cases up there have a lower light level to just help us um, keep them as safe as possible. Um, and then we also wanted to include collections that are popular with our visitors. So we have over 600 paintings by an artist named George Catlin that people ask about a lot. Um, oh, and I meant to include a picture of this and forgot to, but Catlin's whole collection is available in the loose center. At the very end, we have these slots that they're just kind of stuck in like, um, like on a bookshelf. Uh, and you can make an appointment to see those. We, we don't count those as being on view, but they are more accessible for people who um, want to make an appointment to see one of those. Uh, and it's easier on our staff, on our registrar's office, and also them to come to the museum as opposed to going out to one of our offsite storage areas. And then we've also included pieces in here that have great conservation stories behind them um, for some cross-programming with Lender. And the space also gives us an opportunity to talk about our history uh, as a museum. Um, we didn't become an American art museum until 1980, but before then we collected everything. Um, so we have some ancient Roman glass pieces, some French and enamel, um, uh, sorry, French and English enamels, um, a South American table. Um, and these were all given to us by a collector named John Galatly, who actually gave the museum over 1600 pieces, including ones by American artists. So it's just really nice way to talk about our, our pieces and our history as a museum. Um, before we became an American Art Museum. And then since the space is so different from our traditional gallery spaces, we saw it as an opportunity to really experiment with <clears throat> everything we do in our main galleries. So we like to talk about the Loose Center as a lab or a testing ground for ideas um, that might then be launched in the rest of the museum space. So um, we've done some games in here. This is where we kicked off our audio tour. Um, but right away when we opened, we noticed that visitors weren't really sure of this space. Uh, we do have a staff there that sits in an information desk and they record every question they're asked. And um, two of the most popular that we still get are, what is this place and am I allowed up here? And both of these are usually uh, accompanied by an expression that's like, <laughs> so um, part of the confusion I think is that our information desk is on the second floor um, of our space. Uh, the main entry level was not in, originally intended to be part of the loose center. So when they designed it, they uh, put the, the information desk on the mezzanine level that's one above um, and then <laughs> just added the, the main floor after the fact. Um, there's been talk about putting some staff presence down there. So we'll see what that happens. Um, and then our museum is also challenged by signage and as, uh, especially because we share a building with other opportunities. Um, so signage and wayfinding are something we're continually working on. And then also um, the Loose Foundation Center for American Art doesn't really say what we do and what we are. Um, we don't say the word storage in there also. I think there is confusion if you see it on a map um, or anything uh, 
anything printed, you might not know what it is or, or that you can come. Um, and then I'm also not crazy about advertising it as a storage space because I'm afraid that the word storage can imply something like an attic or dusty or dark um, when we're really not. We're a very like vibrant space with pieces that are moving in and out um, continually or not continually, but pretty regularly. And then we also have a really robust series of public programs that I will get to in a minute. Um, another thing too is just with 3000 objects in here, it can seem really, really daunting and overwhelming um, or possibly even exhausting if you've already been to the other main, like the three main floors of the museum and then wander in this space, um, you just might be tired. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned that we have three full-time or I'm sorry, we have a full-time staff. There are, when we're up at full capacity, there are four of us. Um, and then we have a team of really great interns and volunteers and sometimes some federal work study students that um, promote or that support our, our information desk. Um, Pre-pandemic, we did staff that desk every day um, with the exception of holidays. Uh, and we're slowly getting back to having more of a presence um, up there. But one of the, it's really great to have staff in the museum building, talking to visitors every day, um, which has helped us inform some of our programming and some content. It's helped us solve a lot of wayfinding and signage problems. Um, and then um, we've also been able to find community partners and become a space for them. So we're actually looking at a group called Creative Mornings that is a international um, breakfast lecture series group. And it's a, it's a mutually ben beneficial partnership. Um, we're able to host their events maybe a couple of times a year. And then we have this captive audience of like, I think every event that we host for them has over 200 people. So um, these are people that are loyal creative mornings goers that now might know about our space um, through this group and hopefully we'll come back. Um, so collections and interpretation, um, 3,000 objects is a lot to see in one space. Um, and similarly, if we had interpretive labels for every uh, object in the space, it would just feel like um, a lot to read and just be overwhelming. So we've come up with some digital solutions to get this information to people. When we first opened, we had 10 computer kiosks that were located around the space and you could search for the object you were looking for by the accession number, the case number, artist name, object title. Um, now this is all uh, available through a QR code and your cell phone. Um, we also have a short URL for people who uh, can't access QR codes. Um, it's not ideal, but we are working towards a more permanent and more attractive solution. <laughs> um, the labels and uh, object, or I'm sorry, artist biographies for the Lou Center were um, written in that time from 2000 to 2006. Um, and then we've been updating them as more objects are put in the Lou Center. And um, it was really important to our previous director that this information, because there's so much of it, be as easily accessible and as entertaining. <laughs> she, I, I'm going to go off topic a little bit, but she would always say something like, um, the loose center should be chocolate, everything else should be spinach. Um, so uh, we developed a, um, a style guide that's different from the one used in the main galleries that explains every art history term, um, doesn't assume you know anything about art history or American art history at all. So it's really just meant to um, tell, tell really good stories about the artists and the artworks. Um, and this is all available on our website. And it's been really, similarly to talking to people in the museum, um, it's been really great to hear from people who uh, are either related to the artist or in some cases, if we have a portrait miniature where it says something like, um, not a lot is known about this unidentified sitter or this person and we do have a name, sometimes we'll get their family emailing us and saying, well, actually I'm related and I can share this. And so it's been a really great, way to learn about some pieces maybe that we didn't have. Um, we also have an audio tour. Um, this is hosted for our website. We have a printed transcript for those who prefer um, to read it. And it's over 400 stops, so it's not everything, but it is a pretty nice cross-section of the collection. Currently, it's only available, available in English. 
Um, and I would, would like to be better about that. Um, I'm going to start skipping through these pretty quickly. This is, oh, sorry, our scavenger hunt too. This is something it's for the young and the young at heart. Um, we pick about six to eight objects, lead you through the loose center. Um, we do things like animals. We have them for holidays. We have like the color red. Um, my favorite is one called things with wings. So it's birds. Um, we have a, a a buffalo on there for buffalo wings, which I think is really cute. Um, and this helps focus you. It helps, you know, you see a little bit in, in your visit. And then we also do um, some informal learning, like teaching you what an accession number is on this tour. Um, this is my, uh, one of my favorite projects that we used to do. It's called Fill the Gap. Um, and this would help people kind of understand some behind the scenes aspects of museum work, like in choosing a replacement piece for, um, or I, in this case, it was two replacement pieces for two objects that left to go on view elsewhere. Um, so people would vote in gallery. We had printouts of the, of the um, pieces we were suggesting, and then we would type up all of their comments and, and uh, put the winner on our Flickr site. So we're using Flickr, that's how old this is. Um, and then we also had a Facebook presence with it, but this is really, um, something I really enjoyed doing and the staff would get so competitive because um, <laughs> we would have ones that we we personally picked and I won two of them but so public programs this is really how we expect to um, bring a lot of people into the space and teach them about our artworks we I mentioned our more local audience um, so we do a lot of local programming in the loose center we bring in local bands, local artists um, to lead this. And it's really to put DC people or the DC community in touch with the creatives in their community. Um, and then it's, I, we think it's also to support, like important to support these local artists, but also to support your local audiences um, and be a space that they wanna come back to. Anecdotally, I've heard really great feedback about people who just discovered the Loose Center and um, then they come back to kind of show it off like it's this really like hidden place. Um, and then it's we also want to do uh, have these low barriers to access. So similarly to like the Creative Mornings group, um, we have a yoga program and we have a music program and um, yoga and music are so popular in DC that we wanted to kind of leverage these existing audiences and be a space that they can also come with the hope that once you know about us and our programming, you will come back and look at the artworks. And there is an artwork component to both of those programs too. Um, the yoga pro program does have a self-guided slow looking exercise ahead of it. And the concert program, Loose Unplugged, um, we asked the band to pick an artwork in the Loose Center, and then we'll give an object talk about it. Um, it's also really important to me that we keep these programs free if possible, but for the yoga program and the Beyond the Studio, the Artist Workshop series, we do charge a nominal fee just um, to make sure people show up <laughs> um, because we don't wanna have our, our speakers or our teachers there with, um, with no one to, <laughs> to talk to. Um, so during the pandemic, we moved everything online and I'm not sure that we'll ever entirely be back into the, uh, into the space totally. Um, our concert series, we started, we partnered with Hometown Sounds, which is a local music, um, podcast and got a little, a section in there, um, uh, for our loose listening parties. And then our artist workshops, we just moved over to Zoom. And these have been really great because we get, that we limit them to 40 people, but um, we're doing, we're getting around 20 that are local to DC and then 20 that are all around the country with some international um, visitors with, or participants. And that's just something that we would not have been able to do if we kept it in person. So I imagine we're gonna be doing some kind of half and half programming um, for the future. And then what's next? Um, I mentioned we are about to start a or, or they have already started, um, at least thinking about the reinstallation and reinterpretation for the main galleries. And this will inform what's put on view in the Loose Center and then also um, any kind of new interpretive elements that we uh, establish for the galleries will probably also incorporate into the Loose Center. 
Um, I would like to tell more inclusive stories. I would love to have our, to expand and enhance the audio tour. Um, and do, I would love to do more accessibility programming too. Right now our docents run um, touch tours uh, out of the Loose Center um, where it's all sculpture that were identified by our conservation and registrars and curators as being safe to touch for low vision visitors. Um, but I would love to see if there's even more we can do there. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm also interested to see what our programming looks um, like as we move back into the space and get less, less digital. Um, this actually was a really great opportunity to, for us to reevaluate what old programs we were doing and maybe like what we won't bring back. So um, I'm really excited about the Loose Center. And I hope you all will come visit DC when you see it or when you're here um, and then come see it. And then I also have my email if anyone has questions or um, I went a little quickly. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'll just, I'll stop there and I can't wait to talk to everybody. Thank you so much, Bridget. That was wonderful. Yes, and I think um, from both presentations, the um, stories that you're telling, the images you're sharing are certainly an uh, invitation to come in person and to, to see and deal with these collections uh, individually. We have a number of questions already uh, in the Q&A, and so maybe I'll moderate those. Um, and I'll start with our first question, and I'll actually link it with another one. And it is, how are particular objects shielded from the public? For example, and I think this is probably directed mostly to Susan, um, indigenous ritual objects not meant to be viewed by uninitiated people in visible storage. And related to that, um, this is Sebastian's question. You touch on interpretation and I'm curious if there's any signage for the intervention for the mask. So the wrapped mask that you shared with us and how we are privileged to see some though that it's not how it would normally be stored in its source community. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, those are great questions. So thanks. Um, the, the question about shielded from the public. So there are two things that can happen. One of which is that we do have some pieces that um, it's that people have said are still okay for them to be in the space, but not on display. So those are in boxes. And then there's a label that lets people know that this is something that they are, they are not to see. There's another system that we have as well for something that is uh, shadowed mm -hmm. to indicate that ceremony still takes place, but that you can't actually see what's happening. And that was done with the practitioners who said, yes, we, we, we agree that we want people to understand that we're still uh, practicing who we are and our faith. Uh, but we don't want them to actually see anything. So here's a way to, to do it. So there's a scrim and a, a, just a, sh a very faint shadow. Um, the other way is that uh, works, belongings are moved into a culturally sensitive research room that we have that is behind the scenes. So there is a, there is a movement actually a flow um, of, of materials, uh, belongings that sometimes go from the visible to the culturally sensitive research room and sometimes come out um, as communities of practice change and, and, and alter their, their considerations as to what they're willing uh, to share at different time periods with the public. The wrapped mask, yes, it has a beautiful label. Um, if I had it here, I would read it to you. It is by Mike Willie, who's Zawodenuk, and he talks in the label about how the community came. They looked at the masks. They had deep conversations. He said, not everybody was in agreement, but we've decided to have them on display, but we wanted to wrap one to demonstrate how we would care for our treasures. So yes, there's a, there's a very clear label there. Thank you, Susan. Um, the next, there are a couple of questions here that have to deal with preservation issues. And Bridget, you mentioned, you know, that some objects are not on display that are in the collection. Uh, for example, uh, photographs, works on paper, some of the fiber and textile materials. And Susan, you also mentioned that as a kind of concern and ongoing sort of conservation question in this 
So I, I guess the question is, you know, how are you dealing with preservation issues related to, you know, UV, et cetera? And um, then the, yeah, let's just stop there and then we'll talk about the touching part uh, next. So any sort of observations about light, right? And the challenges of, of dealing with light in these open and visible storage. Yeah, Bridget, do you wanna go first? Uh, I actually do have a, a little anecdote for this. Um, Scott, our lighting guy has been experimenting with um, keeping the lights on timers for some of the cases that have more uh, sensitive objects in there. Um, and then he has also talked about wanting to get sensors, um, trying out sensors for the lights there too. And we do have monitors, um, uh, different environmental monitors in our cases. And um, since the conservators are right next door, uh, I, they have moved not specifically for light, but um, every once in a while we might have requested something to be installed in the loose center. Um, and they'll note that uh, there might be a condition issue, um, but if it's not an immediate threat, they'll, they might say something like, oh, I've been keeping my eye on this. It will actually help me if we can install it in the loose center so it's next door and I don't have to go to um, go off site to look at it. Um, but they are, I mean, our conservators and our registrar's office are, are very, um, and our exhibitions team who does the lighting are very aware of, of the sensitivities. Yeah, and I would say the same for us. We have uh, fantastic conservators on staff. So the light levels in the visible storage were set by our conservation staff. Um, so they're they're kept at those light levels for the materials, of course, that are in the drawer units. The drawer units are closed most of the time. They can stay quite easily. And the amount of time that they're open doesn't isn't going to uh, be a problem for them. With the um, with the, the prints and the textiles that are on display, uh, the curators all get messages that say things like, in six months time, your textiles, your prints are up for rotation. Please send the, the next list of materials uh, that will be going out. So there's a constant uh, rotational schedule and sometimes you can set them for three or four years out if you, if you want. So that's all, that's done all the time. Wonderful, it sounds like, um you know, that sort of consideration of preservation is even more pronounced in this kind of visible storage. Because of course, light meters and conservation assessments are part of museum operations generally, uh, but even more so it would seem when you have many of these objects out on display in this way. Right. And people, oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, people really are interested um, in, in conservation, especially when they can, learn about uh, what we do um, and then kind of apply it to things that they own and want to keep safe. I mean, to uh, it's a different degree, obviously, but um, we have a lot of real, of real interest in our conservation center and what we do. And, and, and we do likewise. And, and so what, the, what our conservators have done is they have a special label that's a conservation label. And in areas of the MVG where there are particularly low light levels or something is unusual, they have put in a little label that explains why something is different so that the public goes, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's great. And I guess the next, the, sec, the next question related to sort of conservation and preservation of these materials is how do you keep people from touching visible storage? And if someone wants to see the back of something, rather than just the front side, is there a staff member who can handle them on site? And both of you mentioned sort of some things being hands-on um, or tactile tours. And I'm wondering um, to the question from one of our attendees, well, what if you wanna see the back of something or how is, can we touch other things than just through the particular tactile areas? Um, I can start. Sure. So um, our touch tours are uh, very closely monitored um, for as uh, far as seeing pieces in the cases. Um, I should have mentioned this in, when I was talking earlier, but our loose center is based in our external, external affairs and digital strategies department of the museum. Um, so just because we're so visitor focused, um, 
public programs, visitor services, all of that. So we don't actually have keys to the cases. If somebody wants to see something, um, they will have to make an appointment with our registrar's office, which is something that we can facilitate for them, but we can't open the cases. Um, as for seeing the backs, we did this really expensive project where we picked about 20 objects. I don't wanna tell you how much it cost and we photographed them all the way around and so, and that was available on those computer kiosks that I mentioned. And I, uh, I was telling a tour about this one time and somebody was like, well, why don't you just put mirrors behind the objects? So uh, maybe we'll do that one day, but if, if you do need to see something up close for, for research, we can make an appointment for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so what we have is the, the cat, the cat terminals, the, the catalog terminals in the space, they have access to all the images and high resolution versions of all the images of the pieces. So when we actually redid the, the MVG, we actually took high resolution digital images of everything. So there are the fronts, the backs, the sides, so that you can actually, uh, we didn't go the, the 3D route. We you, you can zoom in on the images and get really, really close up and tight on the on the backs and the fronts of them. In terms of um, touching and handling the pieces that are behind glass, uh, that's done through, um, you do still have to go through collections and make a make a call. We We do probably, I would say, two to three collections access visits a week with wow. communities and and uh, artists and researchers. And I guess just to quickly follow up on that, um, for staffing purposes, uh, Susan, you would seem like you'd need to have staff available if you're having that many um, object request, study requests weekly. Um, what does that mean for how you organize? Who would be working? Are there people that are specifically dedicated to working with uh, community groups um, who are coming in? We have we have one staff member who's dedicated to to that. Okay. And Bridget, um, you had mentioned obviously researchers who are wanting to use the our collection in that sort of way. Uh, would they also work with particular staff? We don't have nearly as many, I don't think, as as Susan gets. But um, yeah, we would we would just take their information and what they wanted to see. Um, and we get some, a lot of like casual interest too. Sometimes we get uh, family members who want to see something that their grandmother donated or something. Um, but for our more, our more serious scholars, we'll just handle those, put them in touch with our registrar's office directly. And anybody at the information desk that works there can handle this. Um, and there, are, there are three full-time staff members that work there. Um, but for those for those casual ones, uh, we'll kind of put the, the burden on them and say, well, here's the information and you initiate the, um, the, the request. On our website, we will tell you if something is on view, um, which is really helpful for people to, to find out about. Um, but I think, I think it's also people, maybe they're becoming more aware of this, but I think for a long time, they were surprised to learn that they could see something up close or see something in storage. I think they thought that what's on view is what's on view. Um, so I think, yeah. So making that invitation um, more pronounced, like, well, yes, you can actually see these up close and personal. And I loved what, Susan, what you said about inviting all to become researchers. I wrote that down, I loved it. <laughs> so. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> also wrote it down. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to continue. Um, Aaron has shared a question, and I believe this is specifically for uh, the nature of Susan, the collection Susan works with. Um, I'm also thinking about the ways that some kin objects are kept in relationship slash communication in some museum storage spaces off display based on a community's direction. Examples such as being regularly engaged with by a conversation, playing music to, with, et cetera. How do you find that kin objects in this type of multiversal storage are kept in relation slash communication? How is it different from other types of storage engagement? And do you see any aspects for improvement or change? 
I think it's um, it's a great it's a great question. Um, and yes, of course, there's always room for improvement and change. Um, so one of the ways that I can think of as I can relate a story of something that just happened, uh, and it doesn't quite answer this, but maybe slightly does answer this, is that um, there's the issue of the keeping the pieces in kin relation, but many times in museums, we don't actually know the kin relation. We have so many works that are just given a general location of where they're from, their provenance has been uh, stripped away and erased. And we just had an example of uh, Tla'amen, who are one of the indigenous uh, peoples up the coast here, who came for a visit and they walked into the visible storage area and they said, those six foot figures look familiar. And then they texted a colleague back in the community who sent back a photograph from the 1890s. And they are two grave figures from their community. So we thought they were from an entirely different community. They were actually in relation with potentially the wrong kin objects. But the fact that they were out there has made and allowed for that connection to take place. So what it's given us the ability to, and this is why I say it doesn't quite answer the question, is to respond to kin when they come to the building and see belongings that are from their community that should be in dialogue with each other, should be in communication or should be somewhere else to actually bring that forward to us and for us to then make those uh, connections. So that's part of the, the ongoing work that the space actually does uh, help us with. It also, in terms of the, the playing music and things like that, what it does enable is it enables groups who are coming in to do that work in the space. We have the people come in all the time, um, either to sing or to dance or to drum to particular works that are in the collection. Thank you, Susan. So I have a question, I, and it's broadly speaking about how technology has changed the way we think about visible storage. Um, both of you have mentioned, you know, the CAT system at UBC. Uh, Bridget, you showed us some screen captures from your website and some of the online programming that you pivoted to during COVID uh, shutdown. You also uh, both sort of mentioned in your comments about how the visitor can use the online collections uh, in different ways to uncover answers to their own questions in gallery spaces where there may not be a lot of interpretation. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, changes that you've seen and how technology is being leveraged to activate and animate the collections and sort of what next things are. And you've discussed a bit, you know, the 3D um, effort to do the 3D digitization, which I should, as a quick, quick aside, say we actually have a, a brown bag in December, a student will be talking about digitization of objects in a natural history collection setting. Um, but I'm wondering sort of more generally, technology, has this made open storage more feasible, richer, or are there still limitations? What are your thoughts? Uh, I can I can start with that. So one of the big limitations of visible storage, the physical, because there's so many positive things to say about it, is that once you have placed an object somewhere, you have created a classification system. It is, right, intentional or unintentional, Western, Indigenous, it is classified in some way. By, the, by how you've placed it and what you've placed it in relation to. One of the amazing things about uh, technology such as the, the, the online catalog system and, or the RN and creating your own things is that you can move things around. You can actually modify classification systems and see things in relations to others in a different way than you can when they've actually been put physically in the space. So there's a, there's a, there's a really nice thing there. The other thing is language. Uh, and um, 
Bridget was mentioning their audio guide. We've just recently launched a multimedia guide that has some stops in our in our MVG that is in English, French, and simplified Chinese. So again, that ability to reach out to um, a broader, a more diverse uh, audience and provide them in materials in languages that they're comfortable and more and, and uh, in mother tongues. So those kinds of things are all areas I think where technology is really has the potential to add to what we're doing, um, but it still isn't the same. We recently had totem pole carvers who were replicating a pole in the collection and they, we took all the images they could want, high resolution images and everything, but they still had to come down and see the pole and climb over the pole and handle the pole and touch the pole to understand how the pole was, was carved. So there are, there are limitations as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that technology and as great as our website is and our, as much as we've digitized, it will never truly replace um, the physical object. Rather, it will just help enhance it, I think. Um, and I, I also have noticed that in the past, from when I started at the museum till now, it has been interesting to see how people are more comfortable using their phones in the galleries. Um, whereas before they might think that they were being rude. Um, but now that we we're asking them to use their phones to do stuff, um, to do the audio tour or to, to look up an object, like we're doing that because we have noticed them being more comfortable, but also um, because it is an easy way for us to, to get the um, information to them. But I will also say too, if you are going to ask someone to use their cell phone or a personal device, you should also have great Wi-Fi <laughs> in your building. And some of our cases, yeah, <laughs> not consistent, but, um, and then also a place for them to charge. Um, we don't want people plugging into the floor outlet. So we have, um, we've got a couple, we call them rest and recharge stations uh, around the loose center. And then I think we're talking about putting them in more places in the museum. But if you're gonna ask people to engage with technology, then you should make it as easy for them as possible. Um, and it's also too, anytime in, in my experience, the more places you have your information. So if we have it in our audio tour, luckily, the web labels pull directly from the database. But if we've got information in all these different places, anytime something changes or needs to be updated, you need to remember and change it in all three different places or wherever. Um, so that's another, it can be another challenge too. Um, I personally really like the, um, the technology aspect. It allows us to have a lot. Um, and then also when our staff isn't available to ask questions directly, it helps people find the information they need um, or are looking for. Oh, and I, I I will say too, in our space, when we moved from the computer kiosks, which are about the size of a, a regular desktop computer, um, to the cell phone, I was afraid that we would see some of the more social aspects of our visitors change. Um, instead of people gathering around a bigger screen, I was afraid they would only kind of go off on their own um, but I don't think that has really been the case, though I have no real data to back that up. I just anecdotally think it's been all right. <laughs> More observational evaluation is needed. Yeah. Yes. Well, I regretfully find that we've come to the end of our session, uh, but I wanna thank both of you, Susan, Bridget. Uh, this has been truly illuminating to see how these two museums very different collections, different communities who are engaging and using and sort of adding, you know, their stories and narratives to uh, the works that you are holding and caring for. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this has been wonderful. And thank you to all who have joined us um, to learn more about how visible storage is continuing to change and the promises and challenges that it offers to museum professionals. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.